Okay, welcome back everybody. So here's our second lecture of the week. And big question everyone had is like, okay, pack back and top hat. Again, top hat, wait till next week because we want your subscription to last the whole semester. Because again, there's like 16 weeks plus that extra finals week. And I think top hat, the minimum subscription is four months. So if you're going with that instead of a year, we want your four months to last the entire time. Now, Packback, you can start this week, and Packback does have a subscription fee, and if you actually, and it looks like people have already got a head start, and it's really great to see that, so uh, let's see. And actually, let's review some of those uh, posts right now. So the thing is that one big thing you should do, definitely do is do the tutorial that tells you what type of questions you should ask. Questions you shouldn't ask is like, how are we graded or what's, uh, or how much, like, what should we study for this class? That is class specific. Pack back questions should be about the topics and the, in your textbook and that we cover in the lectures itself. So let's see, um, let's, okay, where is that? community feed. Ah, great. Okay, this part will be blurred out because I can't show names of students like in the later broadcast, but I think these are really good questions we have so far. So this one is borderline over here because I think it talks too much about learning instead of the actual, the, I mean, it, it's, I'll let this one slide, but try to go ask questions more like we have here, like why is it possible for things to regenerate? in some organisms versus us like especially since this is human anatomy and physiology often i don't get to talk about other organisms or vertebrate or other types of anatomy and physiology but this one i think these are pretty good like especially this one right here so why don't we just use medical or common names for body parts i think this is a great question and it also shows you and there are people have already jumped in and responded to that so if you actually try to post a new question, it's like, so it's like, why are you curious about why is it, so why is mitosis so complicated? And then you can just like, and then uh, as you see, it actually gives you a coaching while you're doing that. So it says, okay, now add a subscription description to add, make your question interesting. Yeah. This has multiple faces. And look, as I'm typing, it actually gives you a curiosity score. Currently, this would not meet the minimum because it's very, very basic. But the cool thing is that you can add sources, and actually you're encouraged to add your reference and sources because that's good practice when you're writing anything. But the cool thing is that it also tells you, like, it gives you scores on curiosity, credibility, communication, convention. So if you have very a lot of sp spelling errors, it points it out and it checks your grammar right? and then also tells you about error communication. And it can add graphics to your post, it can bold things. So it actually provides a lot of feedback. Now, if Laulima could do this, I would offer it. But thing is that if you have other classes where there's that Laulima discussion forum function, it's a lot less, yeah, it's very, very basic. And the cool thing is that auto saves things. And even if you, so it saves drafts. And even if you have a question, you're like, oh shoot, I could add more to it later. You could actually edit your responses and questions as well. So I think this is why, even though there is a subscription cost, there is like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I wish I could look at the AI under this, but the cool thing is that it actually gives you feedback while you're typing. And so I'm pretty sure what the subscription fee is to handle the servers and also all the software engineers that must be behind this. Natural language parsing is super hard. Again, I took a graduate class in that. It's It requires a lot of software engineering. So this is why, I mean, if Laulima could do it, but Laulima is very, very basic. So that's why we are using Packback for a forum because again, we want to avoid the stuff where like people post a question and then people say yes, no, or I agree, or something like that. Granted, if you have any classes that are using that discussion forum, I guarantee you're going to see responses like that. And we want to avoid that because that's not that's wasting everybody's time. So again, ask questions that we don't get to cover in here. And again, you should ask questions that are open-ended. They shouldn't be questions where someone responds, end of conversation. You want things that generate a lot of responses like this, 
like this question right here. Lots of thoughtful responses here. So that's what the cool thing about Tech Packback. Okay, so more housekeeping as well. So one thing that if you navigate to Lao Lima, so I guess we have to have a check-in, even though attendance overall in this class counts for big old goose egg, nothing. We still have to take attendance for every class. It's UH policy. So if you go to Lao Lima and go to our assignments, tests, and sur surveys, there is a week one check-in. And all you do is do the check-in, begin the check-in, click get something here, and then finish. And that's your participation. So if you don't check in, then so packback is it <laughs> packback is worth 12%. So you don't have to buy, use packback, but if you don't use packback, your maximum score is 88%. So again, packback, again, we don't get to cover everything in this class, but packback is trying to get you to think beyond the material and also apply the material to more situations that we would love to cover but frankly don't have time to cover in this class. I mean that's why I love seeing things like outside perspectives as well like that one about like why don't we just talk call the knee the knee? Why why we have to, why do you call it plateller? Why do we call don't call the why would we call the shoulder acromial? Why don't we just see the shoulder? So it's very interesting stuff that you can ask there. So it's more to say like okay this isn't just like simple stuff. So yeah, do the check-in and you'll have your part in the class. So then this is our attendance for this week. So as long as you do it, you just need to submit it. And it's just one, just a simple check-in and you're done. Let's see, is there a code? So if you have fine, I'll check with our representative, but if you really, if you're on financial aid or if you have something very, spe I think can check with the rep, but Again, uh, email me with that if you're like, oh, okay, this is kind of tough to pay for, okay? All right, so enough housekeeping. And let's get on with our presentation. Okay, so now we're finally going to talk about enough class management. Now let's finally talk about anatomy and physiology. All right, so what are anatomy and physiology? So why, what does class mean? So anatomy is a study of body structures. So basically the form of your body, all the structures within. And then physiology, this is a study of the body's processes and functions. So it's not only just like what the parts of your body are, but also how they function together. Now with anatomy and physiology, so here we have a bunch of car parts and a good mechanic can name all these parts, the, how they fit together. They know how where the location of all these parts of an engine are, but just by knowing the parts of the engine, do you know how an engine works? So you can name and recognize all these parts, but a good mechanic not only knows na the names of all the parts and how they fit together, but also how they work together. So anatomy is like knowing all the parts of your body and how they fit together, where they're located, and physiology is knowing how they work together. So again, a good mechanic will know like how to fix a car, how? Because they know what to parts that there are, what their function is, how they fit in the overall car. And then if they're trying to repair the car or their engine, they know which parts to replace and look at, test, and then how to fix it as well. So just like healthcare professionals, they're, they not only need to know the parts of the human body, but they also need to know how they're supposed to function as well. Because if someone's suffering from a disease or some sort of disability, then they want to try to help fix that problem as well. So a good mechanic just doesn't know anatomy, it also knows physiology. Okay, for the slides, that they'll be uncensored, but when this, you're going to see a lot of the human body because again, it's anatomy, right? So there is nudity in anatomy and physiology. Of course, it's all in very clinical settings. Actually, this is left over from Twitch because Twitch has stronger, um, I think, nudity policies than um, YouTube Live. So YouTube Live is pretty relaxed, but the thing is like sometimes these get age restricted because they say, they say like, okay, it's showing naked bodies, so then we have to restrict it. So if you see these blurs, that's just because it's like left over from when I streamed on Twitch. All right, so think about this way. Is this the left or the right side of the body? And I have chat enabled, so you can try take a guess. <coughs> Actually, maybe I can try the pull part. Is this the left or the right side? Yeah, 
so it seems like most people are saying left and I think people have been reading so great so most let's see 90 votes Okay, looks like most of you said left, and the most of you are correct. This is the left side of the body. So the thing about the left side of the body, so why, you might be like, wait, isn't this the right side of the picture? So in medicine, it's not about you. It's all about the patient. So this is the left side. This is the patient's left, because if you're telling the doctor, my left side, my left arm hurts, and they say, well, from my perspective, that's my right. Therefore, I think this arm hurts. So again, it's about the patient describing where their pain is, and this is what you should use for anatomy. You're talking about the patient's left, not your left. So I think pe um, people who have experience in theater, they say, like, is it audience left or stage left? So I believe it's like talking about stage left versus like actual like the audience. You're just a doctor. You're not an or doctor or healthcare provider. So again, it's about the patient's left and right, not your left and right. So I don't have this mixed up. This is the left side of the body. So because again, you have to kind of think about it, like this is the person who's you're coming in to see you. This is their body, right? Okay, so this is the right side of the body, so, uh, correspondingly. So everyone knows left and right. And once in a while, in some older textbooks, you might see sinistral and dextral, but that's kind of largely out of favor. Most, this is one time where they actually do use the common terms for left and right. Okay, so let's have another fun activity. Ooh, single. Add option A. All right, new poll. So which one, who among these people are, is most likely to be single? I wish I had a flower here. I have flowers here, but they're too small to wear. <laughs> yeah, so a little hint there. So it has to do flowers, but something's there. Okay, so it looks like in terms of the poll, 8% said A, 16% says B, 31% says C, 46% says D. Now, as the majority is like, okay, just based on things, like it's funny, like whenever I press this question, people start analyzing faces, and it's really great the answers I get. But if we're talking about the flower, the person most likely to be single is this person right here. And why that is that? Well, which is, notice where the flower is on all of these people. So this person is hard to tell. So she's wearing her flower on the left side, He's wearing the flower on the left side. She's wearing her flower on the right side. And he just has a hakule. He doesn't have a flower on either side. He has flowers all up and everywhere. But so this is what I heard. And this is what I grew up, <laughs> heard growing up. But if you put the, how, flower, the flower on your left side and your left ear, that means you're taken. And why is that? So again, pua on the left is kind of like when you wear, wear your ring on the left hand, right? So that means your heart is taken and your heart actually, so they say, think it's like, okay, it's the one where it's on the, if it's on the left, because the heart, the flower is closer to your heart, that means you're taken. So if it's toward your left, if it's on the right, that means your heart isn't taken and that you're single. So kind of like wearing your ring on your left versus your right. So yeah, if you're just going by the flower, this is a way you can signal, signal your signal or not. Although some people, they don't know this rule and they're like, oh, okay, then why are you hitting on me? I'm taken, but they just don't know this. I mean, I don't know, if it could be different on other islands. I mean, I grew up on the west side of the islands or a different side, but this is the part, the way I learned it. Okay, and why is it important to know left and right? Because you want to treat the right side. And even when you're into medical school and this is scary part, like surgery mix-ups, and this was back in 2010, and I'm pretty sure if I searched now, like, I mean, granted, I can't search right now because 
you don't want to be in an emergency room right now, okay? Because like this is like when you have wards completely and all beds fit with COVID patients, but that's another thing to say for another day. But again, this is what can happen if you don't know the left or right. Say someone has a right kidney that's failing, and then you, you don't t t tell you mix it up and you accidentally remove the left kidney. Well, if you remove the healthy kidney, you left the diseased kidney into in your patient, and now they had need a kidney transplant, and now they're suffering from kidney renal failure. So again, it's very important to keep know the left and right, and yeah, so amputating the wrong leg. Say you have a you have to amputate infection in your right leg, and then you accidentally amputate the healthy left leg. You left them with a bum uh, diseased leg, and you have to cut it off anyway. And so now they're without both legs. So this is why it's very important to know left and right. And I love showing this because this guy right here, he wanted to he had need to amputate his left leg or left lower leg right here. He actually got this tattoo to make sure that there's no issue. And this is why it's very important in surgery that surgeons actually label this and know, make sure that where the injury is, if it's on the left or right side, because again, you don't want to cut off healthy tissue. And I think there was actually an re interesting regeneration question in Pack Back. But yeah, you don't want to, You. this is why it's important. It's very elementary, but if you mix up left and right, that can be, uh, that can cripple your patient or it could potentially kill them as well. So again, I love that tattoo. All right, so why do we need to know left and right? Well, we're going to talk about, about abdominal pelvic quadrants. So quad means four, right? So we have our upper quadrants and we have our lower quadrants and you just combine that with left and right. So this is the left upper quadrant and this is the left lower quadrant and right upper and right lower correspondingly. So again, this is about your patient's anatomy, not about your view. It's all about your patient, right? So four means quad, right? So in quad, you have a quad, you're riding on a quad vehicle, a quad ATV, it has four wheels. So this quadrants and regions, uh, they're referring to the abdominal areas, but there are four quadrants and nine regions. So they're not interchangeable. Quadrants aren't the same as regions. They overlap, but they're not the same. Now there are nine regions right here. So draw a tic-tac-toe grid right here. And you have the, the navel, the umbilicus, the belly button over here, the pico. So this is what we have here. Now the nine regions, what are they? So what, what do we have here? Well, where does the umbilical cord attach to? So we all had an umbilical cord at one point, but when we detach it, now we have our umbilicus, our navel, our pico. So this is our umbilical region. So the umbilical region, that's the center of that tic-tac-toe grid. Now let's go over here. So here is the stomach and a root word for the stomach you commonly used in medical terminology is the gastro or gastric. So what we have here is the epigastric region and epi, so it doesn't mean as an epic, but whenever you see that prefix epi, it typically means above or outer. So what we have here is that we have the gastro part and then we have the, so gastro refers to the stomach or gastronomy. So that also refers to like the just eating food, right? So here we have epigastric, so kind of like above and outer to the stomach, and hypogastric, so this is the, or sometimes it's called the pubic region. The same region, depending on textbook, know that hypogastric and pubic are synonymous. They mean the same region. So hypo is actually another common prefix you see in anatomy and physiology and medical terminology. That means low or below or under. So you might be wondering, well, why don't we just put the hypogastric region right here? So this is the way I memorize it. So this is already occupied by your umbilical region, right? So they put the hypogastric, they just, this is already occupied by umbilical region. So hypogastric actually refers to this region, the lowest of the, the center, but the most lowest and inferior. Actually, we'll get to inferior in a bit. All right, so over here, so in the upper left and right corners of the tic-tac-toe grid, we have something called the hypochondriac region. So this is different when you say someone's always going to the doctor because they're thinking they might be sick all the time. That's a different type of hypochondriac. What this is referring to is this. So this is your rib cage, 
and this light color part is what is actually made of cartilage. And hypo, again, another, we're reusing that same term, it means low, below, or under. Now chondro, whenever you see that used in medical terminology, that refers to cartilage. So this cartilage, what it's referring to, this hypochondriac region, doesn't mean that you're always think, getting sick in those areas. It means that this is below the cartilage. I know that's it's like that's the best that we can do with that, but let's just accept it. So the ribs are kind of in this area, and this is why it's the hypochondriac region. Now over this part, so in the left and right middle parts of this tic-tac-toe, this is what we, so notice that it's around the level of your lower back. So think about this way. This is a lumberjack, right? And lumberjacks, in order to chop wood, they need very, very strong cores and very, very strong lumbar regions. So I like to think of it this way. This is the left and right lumbar regions. So you need a strong lower back to, and strong core to be a lumberjack. So these are the left and right lumbar regions, respectively. Now, over here, so the bottom corners of the tic-tac-toe grid. So what are these? And this is an interesting medical term. So there's something that runs along here called the inguinal canal. So this is the left and right inguinal region. And inguinal, if you haven't had any anatomy in physiology before, this is probably a new term for you. So I, whenever I have a new, or when I'm learning new terms, often I like to use silly mnemonics because why? It helps me relate it to something I already know. So this is my mnemonic that I was when I was first learning anatomy and physiology. I like to think of it this way. So here we have your pet iguanas, and iguanas they're reptiles. They're cold-blooded and they like to keep warm. So say your pet iguanas are very cold. What can you do? Put them near your inguinal region warm them up. So I like to think of it, inguinal iguanas right here along this groin line right here. So again, so now we have our nine regions. So all of these, I do expect you to know all the quadrants and all the regions, and this is what we have here. So again, four quadrants and nine regions. And why are they important to know? Because what if a patient says, oh, my, my stomach or my abdomen hurts, and you're like, Oh, okay. So when he says abdomen or she or she says abdomen, what do they mean? Well, this can be anywhere over here, right? But what if you want to, you're, you're examining them, you find where the pain is. Are you going to say he has a pain, he or she, or they have a pain in their abdomen? Well, it's like, is the pain here? Is the pain here? Is the pain here? Is the pain here? And it can be in different locations. So this is why it's important to know your regions. Because what happens if you look below the surface? This is where you have all your abdominal organs. And so this is where you have here, different organs are located in different regions and different quadrants. And this is why it's important to know these regions. Because say someone says like, oh, I have a pain. And can you, say, can you describe or locate where the pain is? And they say like, mm, it's kind of toward my right side and kind of like toward my lower area. So what's in the right lower quadrant? Well, you see the large intestines, you see the, the small intestines as well. So you probably think, yeah, it's more, most likely to be an intestinal problem rather than if it was a stomach problem or a liver problem or something with the heart or lungs. So this is how it allows you to kind of think, okay, what's in that area and what could be causing that pain? Or if they say, I have a pain, but it's kind of central and all the way like, down toward my groin area and it's like okay it's probably not the bones over here if it's kind of central hey maybe it could be something wrong with their something infecting their bladder over here or the reproductive organs so this is why it's important to know the regions and anatomy because if you're able to kind of like pinpoint where the pain is you can kind of deduce and say like okay these are the likely culprits that are causing the pain so this is why it's important to know that. It's not just something true that we're just making up names for regions. And not only is it no important to communicate, but when you're writing it down as well, because again, you can say abdominal pain, but which is better to say just abdominal pain or whether it's the like general, or if it's able to pinpoint it to a certain point, it's better to be as specific as possible because again, it helps you kind of figure out what's going on. All right, so on that topic, root words, prefixes, and suffixes. And this is one of the initially challenging parts when you're first learning anatomy and physiology or anything involved with medicine. 
So many, many, many medical terms use Latin and Greek root words, and this is why it's often different from our everyday use. Do we speak Latin and Greek and every time? I mean, there's influence in the English, English language, but it's not always there. So why does it pay off to learn these root words like I talked about earlier, like hypo, epi, and, hy and hyper? Well, they make it easier to learn new medical terms because these root words appear over and over and over again. So sometimes if you have a big enough vocabulary of these root words, you can actually see a new word and somehow break it down into parts and kind of get a, make an educated guess at what that new word means. So we already covered some like hypo and epi. These appear multiple times in the semester and throughout medical terminology. Okay, so let's talk about anatomical landmarks. So what are those? Well, this is like, so the, this, I think there's a version of this in the open sax version, but these are surface landmarks talking about major regions. So as you can see, major landmarks, I'll upload this later, but and notice that the, there are frontal landmarks, upper and lower ones, and you also have landmarks on the back as well. So some of these are pretty obvious, like frontal and forehead and cranial, you probably heard of cranium, facial, face, obviously, right? But how about here? So this, uh, the, there's many things that can describe the eye. So you might hear things like, what is he wearing right here? Well, he's wearing a monocle, right? Or when you have binoculars, where do you use them on? Use them on your eyes, right? Or if you have an Oculus Rift, what do you use? You use it on your eyes. So ocular or orbital on the, is often used to describe the eye. Now over here, we have the ear, right? So ear, so otic is often used, audio as well. So otic refers to ear. So otitis refers to infection of the ear. So or actually inflammation of the ear. So otic is a term for the ear. And I think, oh, so this was back, like I think around the Rio Olympics, like in 2016, when we thought Zika was the worst thing. They often encountered something called microcephaly in pregnant women who were infected by the Zika virus. So notice that these little, these children, they end up with smaller than normal heads. So cephalic, so that is a useful term that means the head. So sometimes, or there's another condition that can affect infants when they have too much, their heads are swollen up and it's due to a lot of fluid accumulating there. So that's all called hydrocephaly. So whenever you hear that term cephalic, that refers to a head. And okay, this is a silly mnemonic I have, but what what's this candy, chat? Tell me what the candy this is. These white candies. Oh, they went too shy. Mentos, yeah. So this is the way I remember it. Mentos, don't. <laughs> so this is the way I like to think of it. This guy's eating a bunch of Mentos, and then one of them, he's a sloppy eater, and then one of them with that's thick with saliva sticks to his chin. So he's eating Mentos. He one slips out, ends up on his chin. So I like to think that mental is chin. So you might think like when you think mental exertion, you think mind. But I like to think of mental in terms of an anatomical landmarks. It actually refers to the chin area. So that's what we have here. So think of a mental on your chin. That's the way I remember a mental. And this is Thor, right? So Thor, and actually before it uh, was it Endgame, right? Or was it was it the previous one where he got like super Momona? But Thor, either way, regardless of his BMI, he always has a big chest, right? So the chest area and this area right here, this is thoracic. So the thoracic refers to the chest. Thor has a mighty broad chest. Thoracic refers to the chest. And then this guy, I mean, don't, I, I've, actually I don't use this because everyone sa says it smells way too strong. I don't use this, but think of it this way. Not product placement, I don't get any money for this. But this is where, where do you use this deodorant? He's going to, he has, pretend he has stinky pits. Where is he going to use that deodorant? He's going to use it as armpit. So axillary or axilla, that refers to armpit. So this is the way you can think of it. If this goes out, stop selling, then I can't use this mnemonic anymore. The thing is like, oh, his axillary area smells so bad, he's going to use ax on it. So axillary is the armpit. And oh my God, this guy, he injected so much into his biceps that they broke. So yeah, his arms are so big, they broke. In fact, he breaks his arm by exercising it and injecting it with a lot. 
So I think that he arms are so buff and so swole that they end up breaking. So brachial is another term for the arm. And this one is silly. So what shape is this? This is a cube, right? So think of it like actually it should get like something like a building block or something. But pretend you're taking a have a cube and you're trying to hold on to it in the crook of your elbow. And why are you trying to hold that cube in the crook of your elbow? Because that is your anticubital area. So anticubital is the front of the area of, of the elbow. And why is it important to know all these? Well, some of these, like there, if you're talking about the cubitus of their arm or yeah, median cubital vein, where do you find it? You find it in this area. And umbilicus, we already covered that. That's your navel, navel or pico. And okay, so let's go to the lower body or actually a little more distal in a way. Ooh, ouch, like you type too much you and your hand feels numbly, numb and tingly and pain. What type of syndrome do you have if you have that? If you type too much and you're like, oh, I can't grip anything and I feel like the shooting pain and radiating throughout my arm. Ow, 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 I have blank tunnel syndrome. Yeah, you're thinking carpal tunnel syndrome, right? So carpal refers to the wrist. So carpal is a medical term for the wrist, and tarsal is the one that refers to the ankle. So not the same thing. Yeah, so carpal, that's where it comes from. And hey, what type of bones do you find in your wrist? You find the carpal bones, right? So this is why it pays off to know these terms, because often you hear these terms used over and over again. All right, so, okay, dirty jobs, and you're doing labor with your hands, right? You're doing this, you're getting your hands dirty. So what type of labor are you doing when you're doing things with your hands? You're doing manual labor, right? So manual labor, manual refers to hand. And actually, if you know, like, romance language, like, what does manos mean in, or in English if you know Spanish? Or if you have man in French, what does that mean refer to? That refers to your hands. So this is where kind of knowing these Latin-based languages, if you have a second language or have taken those classes, sometimes they can come in handy as well. And did, what, what are these? When you're using numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, what are they? They are digits, right? So same when you're counting on your hands, or sometimes called phalanges, but when you talk about something that's digital, that refer, can refer to your fingers. And hey, here's Vin Diesel back in the day, right? Family, family is important. And his family includes his iguanas. So where is the iguanas? These are in his inguinal region, right? So inguinal refers to the groin area over here. Pubic refers more to this area around the genitals. But yeah, because you have the inguinal canal that runs along this. Or like if you really work out, you have those V lines. That's like the kind of showing where the inguinal region is. And what's the longest bone in the body? What's this bone right here? Preview of exam two. You'll definitely need to know this. So this is the yep, yep. That's the femur. So yeah, that big, big, long thigh bone, right? So femoral refers to the thigh, and now you know at least one of the bones now. And this one, okay, this is hit or miss, but think of it this way. So. Here you have uh, here you have paella and you have pastel stew here, right? So if you're balancing a ball of pastel stew on your knees, and why are you balancing a bowl of pastel stew on your knees? Because you're balancing your pastel stew on your patellar area. <laughs> so the patellar refers to your kneecap. So that's the one right there. And ooh, this guy is trying to get in the World Cup, but and then someone kicked him in the shin. That was a cruel thing to do, right? So think of it this way, if someone kicks you in the shin, that's a cruel thing to do. So the cruel area is your legs. Then you have tarsal, so again, carpal wrist, tarsal ankle. And hey, what do you pedal a bike with? You pedal it with your foot, right? So the pedal part refers to your foot. Pedal is an anatomical term. And you also have digits and phalanges in your toes. So usually I'll specify when I talk about digits, like if it's in the hands or the feet. But just know that the feet, the, the, the digits, and the, are actually everything except the big, your thumb right here, and everything except the big toe, these are digits. So the smaller ones, these are digits up here in the hand, and smaller digits here in the foot. So interesting thing is that the pollux is your thumb on either side, 
and your hallux is your big toe or your great toe. So think of it this way, when you're dialing, so which are you going to dot, like often these get confused with the people who are still learning anatomy and physiology. So if you're trying to dial, like say you see something crazy going on and you're trying to dial the police, what are you going to do? Are you going to use your hand? You're going to dial it 911, right? With your thumb, right? So I think of that. If you're trying to dial the police, you can dial 911. And hallux. So this works if you know if you know pigeon, right? So which is more likely to be? Uh, this is my mnemonic for knowing the hallux. So H. So I like to think it. The hallux is hauna. So hauna is like local term for stink. So if you say you've had a, did a big hike at Manoa Falls, your foot gets wet, and at the end your hallux is hauna. So they both start with H. Hopefully you don't have a stink thumb, but think of it this way: after a long way exercise the hallux can get hauna, so H starts with H. And here we have our cephalic and cervical, so the back landmarks, and hey, acrobats! Acrobats and gymnasts, they need really, really strong shoulders, right? Why is that? Well, because that chromial area is your shoulder. And actually, there's something, when we get to the bones, there's something called the acromion that refers to the point of the shoulder. So this is why acromial is a very good thing. So think about it this way. Acrobats, anyone doing gymnastics or any of those stunts, they need strong upper body strength and they need strong shoulders. Therefore, the acromial is a shoulder. And what fin is this on a shark or a dolphin? I'm not a zoologist, so I can't really tell. I forgot where it's... But when you're talking about this back fin on a, on a shark, dolphin, or any sort of fish, what is that? Or even whales, too marine creatures. Yeah, that's the dorsal fin. Great. Yeah, so the dorsal refers to the back. So in terms of general, it can refer to the back of anything. Even your hand has a dorsum. So this is the dorsum of your ha hand versus your palm. So the dorsal refers to the back surface of something. Great. And okay, this is another s silly thing. So say you're going through your mom or grandmother. Say you have like very ashy elbows. And if you have very ashy elbows, you want to moisturize, right? So if you have ashy elbows, then you're trying to moisturize it with Olay cream. So why are you moisturizing your elbow with Olay cream? Again, this is in product placement because this is the olecranal <laughs> part of your body. So olecranal refers to the point of your elbow versus antecubital, which is the front. So think of it this way. You have ashy elbows and you're rubbing Olay cream. So that's why you're rubbing Olay cream on your olecranal part of your body. And then down here to the glutes. I know I had to censor this for Twitch. So here we are. I talked about our lumbar region. That's your lower back or loin. And this one. Hmm. What is this? Story time. Pretend it's a bit before times. So hopefully we'll return to it. And then things calm down and booster works. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. That aside, but okay, so pretend you're in the movie theater and you're eating this blue popcorn, but actually it's not quite blue. It's actually a certain shade of bluish green. So you're eating this teal popcorn and then you spit your messy eater and it falls below your knee. In fact, it's trapped under your knee. So you have all this teal popcorn underneath your knee. So why do you have this teal popcorn in your popliteal area? <laughs> I know, that's the best I can do. If you have something better, you can give it to me, <laughs> and I'll share it with the class. But yeah, popliteal refers to that back area of the knee. And there are many things, like there's blood vessels, there are ligaments named after that popliteal area, so that's why it's important to know. So among many muscles you need with the, in surfing is that you need strong legs as well. So I think of this way. This guy's hanging 10. He's hanging 10 uh, using... Many of the muscles in the legs, including his calves. So I think that he's surfing and he has strong calf muscles. And then if you plant your foot on the ground, which part are you stamping upon the ground? You're stamping your foot sole of your foot on the ground, right? So plantar refers to the sole of the foot. So if you some of the this is the way I'm learning like to learn new vocabulary. I kind of come up with these little stories. Why? Because one, they're silly, so they stick in your mind a lot better. And two is like it helps you to think. Okay, this is a this seems scary at first because it's like something totally new to you, but if you're able to relate to what your exam your current knowledge base, then it helps stick even better. Okay, so we talked about anatomical landmarks. Then you also combine them with anatomical directions in anatomy. Okay, so there are many things. 
And this is like, okay, so this is from the Martini version. So it's kind of like seeing this, right? So this is Martini, and then we have the OpenStax. So it's kind of like name brand versus great value, right? So, but I think actually the OpenStax one works better because the Martini, as you can see, they often have a lot going on and a lot of detail. But OpenStax, again, you get what you pay for, right? So it's pretty simple. I think it actually works for this, this context right here. So why are, you have geographic directions, right? So if you lived on the mainland or the state, north, south, east, west, you're used to those cardinal directions. But if you're local, you know things like Mauka and Makai. So people who are new to Hawaii, well, what does Mauka mean? It refers to the mountains, and Makai means to toward the sea and ocean. So often, I mean, if you, you can use north, south, east, and west, more people know it thanks to like various map apps. But if you sometimes it's easier to say like, do you want to head more inland or toward the ocean? And that's when people say, oh yeah, you go a little more Mauka or you go a little more Makai if they're saying to go inland or toward the ocean, respectively. And windward or leeward. So I'm like, I'm from the leeward side of the island. So where does that mean? People typically say windward. At least on Oahu, we say windward versus leeward. There's an earth science definition, but we'd say this instead of saying east versus west. Well, people sometimes still say west side, but again, that's more referring to leeward interchangeably. But I digress. So anatomical directions, they're kind of like this. Because again, when you're giving directions to set, like how to get somewhere, at least before Google Maps became widespread and GPS was everywhere in our phones, the, what would you say? Like, oh yeah, my house, if you want to get to my house, you take the third right past the fire station and then just before the church, then you head a little more south or you head more a little more um, Makai. So things like anatomy is kind of like the geography of the body. So you not only need landmarks, like that church and that, that fire station I talked about, you also need to tell what direction to go because sometimes you can say some things at a particular anatomical landmark, but what if you have something that's like, okay, it's not quite at your wrist, but not quite at your elbow. So you're saying like, oh, maybe it's a little more like, so how can you say something is a little more past a certain landmark in your body? And this is where you can use anatomical directions. So basic directions, well, we already covered left and right. So that's a pretty basic. But again, remember the twist with anatomy is that it's about your patient. So we're looking at this patient right here and she, her, this is her left and this is her right. Now, what is here? So look at her expression, it's kind of smug, right? So when th someone thinks they're way above you, what do they think about it? They think they're superior to you, right? So when something's above, when you're going traveling in the upwards direction, this is superior. And look at that expression, that kind of pout. She thinks you're below her feet. So what does she think you are? She thinks you're inferior. So the opposite of superior is inferior. So above and below, the anatomical terms for those directions are superior and inferior. And then over here is now that we have it in profile. So what we have here is it's going to, or the cranial, so cranium. So where's your cranium? right here, right? So the cranium refers to your skull and your head. So this means toward the head. Now there's an opposite term called caudal. So caudal refers down here toward this area going in the opposite direction. And caudal, actually the root word cauda means tail. So tail, toward the tail or the tailbone or the, the bone itself is called the coccyx in human. So you may be like, wait, humans don't have tails. Well, if you look at embryo, embryos have tails, but ours start to, the thing is that and there goes a process called apoptosis, and this tail actually disintegrates in your, as you're developing in the womb. And actually what we have here is this boy who was born in India, and this, look at here, he has a tail. Actually he had a tail, I think he got, so I think they, he got like super famous there, and they thought it was like an incarnation of, I, I'm not familiar with the religion of that area, they thought it was a, a, a reincarnation of some sort of deity there. But once they cut it off, I think they, he renounced his deity status. But yeah, some people, it's very rare, but they do have a tail. So again, this is toward the tail. So cranial and caudal, these are opposites. So that's one thing you might notice. Wait, what's the difference between that superior and inferior? 
Well, if you're going to veterinary science, well, what about superior? That's if you're talking about of oh, someone who's on a uh, animal that's on all fours, like a quadruped. Well, their their cranial caudal are going to be not going to be upright like we are in humans. So that where that's where it's a, even though they're the same as superior and inferior in humans, in other animals they don't mean the same thing. Well, Hanuman, yeah, that's that's it. Thank you for that. Okay, so we talked about the dorsal fin, so that is referring to the back. So posterior is referring to your dorsal, and when you sit on your posterior, what are you doing? You're sitting on your buttocks, right? So your posterior and dorsal, these are used interchangeably. Again, this is the same in humans, but will that necessarily be the same in an uh, animal? So no, not necessarily, right? So this is why, even though it seems redundant, it often comes from more than just human anatomy and physiology. So posterior or dorsal refers to the back, and the opposites of those are anterior or ventral. So think of it, when you're venting and you're ranting about something, it's coming out from your mouth from your front side of the body, right? And anterior, so anterior is off as a posterior, or if you're trying to hug, hug your auntie, do you want her to hug you from the front, or do you, do you want her to hug you from behind? Well, if you're very close, maybe she can hug you from behind, but typically you hug your auntie from the front, right? So front and anterior is front, ventral also is the front as well in humans. Now. Here we are in profile, now we're going to split her and draw a median line right here. So we're drawing a median strip. And why, where do you find the median strip on a road? You find it right in the middle of the road, right? So whenever you're going from the outside toward the inside, toward the midline, this is where you have the medial. So, so that refers to it. You can approach the medial, you can approach the body medial from the left or the, the, left or the right. So then the medial is toward the midline. And the opposite of medial is lateral. So as long as you're moving away from the midline, so if you're moving this way or if you're moving this way, that is a lateral movement. So what are you noticing here? It's there are many sort so these are many different sort of ways of describing where you are in the body. And okay, I know it's general, but this is public domain as this is over forever. Like if they're gonna ban Leonardo da Vinci, then I'm going to like that. There's no hope for YouTube, but the Vitruvian man, and I like using this compared to the standard anatomical position, because why? I what we have here. If you're going distal, in terms of this, you're going away from the body, so he's pointing off into the distance, right? So think of that. You're pointing off into the distance. You're pointing away from your body. So distal refers to just moving away from some sort of central central structure. If you're talking about the overall body, you're moving away from the center of the body toward the distance. Now the opposite of that is proximal. So proximal is the opposite direction of distal. So if you're moving closer toward the center or some sort of central object, this is what you call proximal. So you can kind of think of like proximal is towards and distal is away. So they're kind of like that, not exactly synonymous with that, but think of that like if you're starting out Distal is like away and proximal is like toward. So yeah, so what's the difference between superior and cranial? Like could they be used in the same, same situation? Yeah, so it's kind of funny. Sometimes people use, oh, it's superior to that or it's toward the cranial side of the body or it's more caudal. So it also like there's, um, yeah, it depends on which organ and which area of the body they're referring to. But this is why you should just know both because sometimes people and physicians use it um, interchangeably. But yeah, especially if you're thinking about going to zoology or animal sciences, then you definitely need to know the difference between cranial and caudal. Yep. So it's the same in humans, but for four-legged creatures, cranial would pour horizontally, yes, because again, four-legged creatures, they're kind of, they're, so for them, they're kind of like anterior and their front would be toward the, that would be different from their, um, would be synonymous with their cranial, but toward their back and posterior, that's where the tail would be, right? So their caudal would be actually synonymous with posterior. At least I'm I'm pretty sure that's it. I have to ask my vet friend. Okay, so medial and proximal. So medial, so it doesn't necessarily mean toward the mid midline. And the thing is like, so what if there is not a midline? So actually when we get to internal anatomy, there's something called the proximal and the distal convoluted tubule. And so it's not talking about the midline of a kidney, it's actually talking about a central subject, 
or a central structure we call like the glomerulus. So the thing is that proximal and distal is referring to like close, it can also be like close and far as well. So near and far could also be rough approximations of pro proximal and medial. Or say you're going like, okay, you have a, like a injury and it's like away from your elbow. So like over here instead of like right next to your elbow. Or let me see, like, yeah, so let's say you have an injury right here. Well, you can say it's like, oh, it's kind of near the antecubital area, but it's actually a little offset. So you can say it's a little more pro distal away from your antecubital area. But say the injury is over here, you can say it's a little more proximal to the antecubital area. Now, could you say it's toward the midline? Well, that would say, if you said medial, it would be toward here, right? So more toward this area. So this is where proximal and distal. So if you're talking about especially the limbs, proximal is here, moving this way, distal is moving this way, medial is moving this way, lateral is moving this way. So then this is why they're not necessarily the synonymous. So yeah, medial and proximal. This is why sometimes it also depends. And the thing is that regardless of where your arm is, medial, proximal, and distal is going to be the same direction no matter where your arm is in space. Okay, and I think we're over time. Dang. Okay. All right, so we'll cover the rest of what I wanted to cover on Friday, and I'll see you all then. And thanks for all participating. And again, don't forget about the check-in right here. So check-in, this is my way of taking attendance, So, so and I'll also make announcement as well. So check in and if it once you get the verification, that means you're verified as participating in the class during the first week. You keep your seat, you don't have to worry about being dropped, all right? Okay, so see you all on Friday. Is there a Discord for this class? You know, I thought of it, but I'm like, maybe when things calm down with the medical school for a while, so I, I gotta think about that, but yeah. I, well, I just wanted to create my own bot as well. So do you have to do your own pack back questions by the end of the week? So the great thing about this grading system is that you don't necessarily need to do one every single week because you can do, um, was it? You can, you can get uh, 100 points every week, right? And the max is 1,200. You only really need to do, like, if you're maxing out your points in a week, you can be done with in 12 weeks. Or you can take, like, a week off or several weeks, or not several, maybe four weeks off at most, all right? Okay, so that's it for now, and I'll see you all on Friday, all right? Yeah, so it's up to you how many questions or responses you want to post on Packback. It's, but the thing is, like, if you're only posting, I think if you, you have to at least, like, um, if you're only posting one question and two responses, you are probably will come up short. So, again, you can post one question up to four responses per week. Yeah, so you can you can make pack back questions regarding lecture, but you can also make about anything that's real. I'm pretty I allow people to, I'm pretty like in loose in terms of like saying, okay, as long as it's kind of health related and something not super <laughs> complicated where nobody else can answer because you're asking like this medical school level question. So you can ask like or I mean some of the best questions are things that come out of left field and I'm like, oh I never thought of it that way. Like, so yeah. Okay, so this week, so what are you expected to do? So again, remember if you go to the syllabus, oh, collapsed it. So if you go to the syllabus, if you want to think about readings, this is what the course calendar has your recommended pictures right here, right? So you are not pictures, chapters. Okay, so your recommended chapters right here, and it has all the topics right there. Friday labs are not in person. All labs are on, yeah, all labs are on a line until further notice, all right? Okay. Zoom today, yeah, so labs are online until further notice. No, it's, so it's like one question and up to four responses. And yes, I'll upload, I upload lecture slides within half or like within 24 hours. So similar to like the, the recordings for YouTube live is like within 24 hours, I upload the lecture slides. So again, office hours, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 
3 o'clock to 4 o'clock, I usually take a little bathroom break and coffee break. So how do you get to the walk-in office hours? Right here. There are no in-person office hours, so then if you want a uh, in Actually, I have to like work out with Star Balance. First time I'm using that system, but I think there's like some sort of like Star Balance system I'm trying out. I might go back to my old system if it doesn't work out well. And lab manual cheaper. Unfortunately, the lab manual price is sent by the publisher, so that's how it is. I, I don't think they even gave us an online option for that. So that's what the lab manual is. All right. Okay. Um. Let's see. So again, due to COVID cases, labs are online. I mean, again, if I could predict the future, I would know. But yeah, if we do move back in, if do, labs do end up in person, we will give you advance notice, all right? So, but again, it's beyond, with depending on things that are beyond contr our control with the whole COVID situation. Again, we can do what we can do. You can get vaccinated, you can practice, say, wash your hands, mask up in public places. But again, in terms of overall population, we just have to just hope for the best. And main thing, stay out of the hospital. Stop doing the crate challenge. This is The ER is not a place you want to be right now. So again, keep those hospital beds free. And this is what they mean by flatten the curve. They should say stem the tide because again, if you, this is, and I think there, yeah, so don't, the hospital is not the place to be, <laughs> all right? Ooh, CT scan. I think I'll cover that next week or next um, lecture, right? So actually, that's something I was going to get to as well. All right. So I got to take a little break right now. I'll see you on Friday.